scientific information in my book if you're looking for more of that science background. So just probably one more slide here on some of this biochemistry and how all this fits together. This is, it's a really complex system. The body is very complex. And autism, if you ever heard Dr. Martha Herbert talk about, she talks about autism as a whole body disorder and the brain being downstream as opposed to autism originating and being a brain, specifically a brain originated disorder. And so when you look at the whole body, like we were talking about a minute ago, you see toxicity and genetics affecting it. And then if you end up with some faulty sulfation or methylation, then you have more inflammation, let's say. You get inflammation in the gut. You can't break down your foods properly. Those foods turn into opiates. They have an effect on the brain. You have a tendency towards bacterial infections. You end up with more antibiotics. That creates yeast overgrowth. That yeast overgrowth can create more inflammation in the gut. And, and so on and so on. And so it is a vicious cycle of really complex systems that are happening here. That's why there doesn't appear to be one cause and one cure because it's much more complex. And there seem to be maybe even a, a variety of, quote, autisms because not everybody has the same history or the same systems that are affected. And what happens is this body biochemistry affects the brain. So we say the brain is downstream. So when you have this faulty biochemistry that affects the body, it also then affects the brain. So yeast overgrowth creating yeast toxins, methylation creating under-methylated neurotransmitters, brain inflammation, increased toxicity in the brain, nutrient deficiencies if your gut is not absorbing properly, opiate production, some substances similar to morphine. So if you think about that, then it, it, it's not surprising surprising that you see what that we see what we see with autism and the types of things that are going on there. And the really wonderful and exciting and profound thing about this understanding is not that it's difficult and overwhelming, but there are things that we can do because it's directly effect there's a direct effect that we can have on the body and effect on the brain. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how simple things like diet, nutrition, and nutrients can make a really profound impact. So why is the GI system so important? Well, firstly, all the food that we take in comes in contact with the gut every single day, every time we eat something. It's the physical barrier for defenses like bacteria. It's the, the largest part of the immune system is in the gut because that's how we determine friend or foe. Did we just swallow a bad bacteria or do we, are these nutrients we need to absorb? Vitamins and minerals are important. They're cofactors for all sorts of enzyme reactions and metabolism. Nutrients, they're also the precursors for the neurotransmitters. If we don't have those coming in properly, we don't have the building blocks for that. And then the greatest concentration of serotonin is actually found in the gut, about 90% of it. And so we call the gut the second brain. And if you've ever had a gut instinct, that's kind of an example of how there is innate intelligence in our gut. And when there is damage or inflammation or problems in the gut, it can have a direct influence on the brain. For example, there's been some case studies of individuals who have had injury to the gut and end up with schizophrenic type symptoms. So the gut is essential and if you look at most schools of thought, you'll see that the health of the GI system determines the health of the body. So how can diet help? Well, we're going to support digestion and biochemistry. So if we have what we call leaky gut, and leaky gut is basically if you have inflammation in the gut uh, you, and you don't have good digestion, then certain substances that are not supposed to get through, like toxins and things, leak through into the bloodstream and start circulating. And things that are supposed to get into the system, like nutrients, are inhibited to some extent. So if we have leaky gut and gut inflammation, we can remove foods that inflame the gut. We can add foods that heal the gut. And we can supply foods that supply good bacteria like lactobacillus, like you'd find in, say, yogurt, although we may not be doing dairy. But that's an example of how we can get this good beneficial bacteria and support that gut. Nutrient deficiencies are very common and well documented in scientific study for children on the autism spectrum. And so we can increase the quality of our food as well as supplementation to help that, as well as the digestibility of the food. 
Yeast overgrowth, when we have yeast, we look at removing sugars, possibly in some cases removing starches and adding probiotic rich foods to the diet. If we have toxicity and poor detoxification, we're gonna avoid toxins in our environment as much as possible. We're gonna avoid food additives and anything we can do in terms of keeping the toxins out of that meal production process. And then if we have faulty sulfation or methylation, we can look at ways of avoiding certain foods that contain some of these things like phenols, and we can improve methylation and sulfation through supplementation. And crucial here is that when children feel better, they learn better. You know when you feel sick, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not up to learning and pay attention, paying attention and listening to people. And we see all the time that as children feel better, they're able to learn better. So symptoms the diet may improve. And these are just a list of symptoms that are pretty common that we see. Everybody's different. Some people have profound jumps in, after implementing diet. Other people and a lot of children, it's step by step. You change something, you get a level of benefit. You change something else, you get another level of benefit. So it is, it's an ongoing process. One of the most common things is the ability to focus. If you think of those opiates that can be created in the gut, think if you were on morphine all the time, how fo foggy you would be and how difficult it would be to concentrate and pay attention. One of the most common things I hear is they're, they're aid or their teacher says they're able to focus better, they're learning better, they're gaining more language. Just yesterday, I heard from, of someone who said that when they implemented the gluten and casein-free diet, I think it was like the, the language jumped about 50 words. So these are some things. Eye contact can change and, and, and get better. Aggression. Gastrointestinal problems. This is a big one. This is, and this is one of the often the, the fastest things that we see improve. Diarrhea, constipation getting better, pain or digestive pain getting better. Language, another big one I mentioned. Sleeping often gets better. Toilet training becomes easier. These rashes and mysterious skin things can tend to diminish or go away, and behavior improves. So autism spectrum disorders are caused by genetic predispositions combined with environmental factors that create this disordered biochemistry and the damage to the organs and the systems. And nutrition has an effect on this chemistry and the body. So here's a, the 12-step process that I go through in my book. We're going to talk about some of the steps here today. I spent about 100 pages going through each of these steps in great detail. So we're going to talk about some of the most important ones today to get you started on this process. And What's important here is that you just start somewhere and little by little start working on each of these steps and over time you'd be amazed at how quickly you can address many of these. So nutrition basics.